welcome to part two of lecture eight so we continue with our topic on recycling and resource recovery so we're going to look a bit at some different types of materials and the recycling process so we look firstly at paper recycling we know this is a very common one and this is one that some of us may be somewhat familiar with to some extent so we know for example that paper is one of the easiest components of waste to recycle and the process is, is fairly simple first we know the, the paper has to be collected and um, it would usually be bailed into a form in which it could be transported um, the paper would be sorted so you know you have different grades of paper so you'd want to sort them and then it's delivered to the mill once the paper is received at the mill they would then add water and turn the paper into pulp the next stage would be a screening process um, where the paper would be clean and then they remove the ink from it um, so it's basically a cleaning process and once that is completed then the paper is ready to be made available as um, a raw material to make new products such as news paper print cardboards um, different types of packaging tissue office items etc um, plastics now on the other hand we we have three types of plastics or three categories ca categories of plastics that could be recycled we have those that are easy plastics um, these tend to be plastics that are a bit thinner um, so you're looking at things like soda bottles, water bottles, medicine containers, and other types of containers. So as I mentioned before, the easier plastics would tend to be thinner plastics. Then we also have plastics um, that are not so thin. Uh, they're less commonly recycled. So you're looking at things like um, plastic pipes, shower curtains, um, medical tubing, vinyl dashboards, you should be familiar with all of these types of um, plastic products and as you know these plastics are they, they're tough they tend to be harder right so that's another category of plastics and then of course you also have the, the hardest plastics to recycle so these are items that are a combination of different types of plastics a uh, combination of the easy and the the um the the harder plastic so um, it might be a product that has a bit of both in it that makes it even harder you harder to even separate them for recycling for that matter so when you go when you have to consider plastic recycling remember part of the process is sorting so you have to sort your plastics into these categories and um, sorry let me just go back to recycling and of course once you had once you've separated and cleaned your plastics you know you just you'd have to break them down now into uh, manageable parts for processing um, and that's part of the recycling process when we look at aluminum recycling now um, aluminum recycling of aluminum requires five percent of the energy used compared to if you had to um, utilize energy for the production of raw materials all right and it also only uses five per, um, produces five percent of the carbon dioxide pollution okay so what you're actually doing by recycling the the aluminum is that you're using less of the energy that you would normally use to um, produce from raw materials and you're also producing less pollution okay um, and another major advantage of aluminum recycling is the fact that it could be recycled indefinitely as the, um, the structure of the uh, product itself is not damaged with each recycling process. So, so the integrity of the structure of the aluminum is maintained. So that is actually a major benefit there. So what we're looking at here now is just an outline of the aluminum recycling process. Um, so let's start here. So this would be our starting point. Um, so you have uh, the used cans are collected. The cans would be sorted at a, um, a sorting and collection point. Um, as mentioned before with many other types of um, recyclable materials, it would have to be broken down. So the cans are shredded. 
the um, the shredded cans are then remelted and made into aluminium ingot cast um, so for those of us who don't know I've defined it here for you an ingot is a ma is material usually metal that is cast into a shape suitable for further processing right so it, it forms a shape they transport it somewhere else for further processing for example they roll it out to make aluminium sheets and those sheets are then used to make drinking cans which are then filled with sodas and put back on the market again and the, the recycling process continues then we have steel recycling um, so steel the, is mined from the iron ore raw material um, the iron the iron ore itself so iron ore as defined here for you the uh, rocks it's a combination of rocks and minerals from which the iron itself is extracted all right so the iron ore um, is available in plenty it's plentiful and is usually combined with oxygen or sometimes carbon or sulfur elements right so um, so this iron ore now is um, it has to be processed in a blast furnace to reduce the pig iron now what are we talking about when we say pig iron so we have to reduce this pig iron in order to make steel so the pig iron is actually the molten iron that is melted down in the blast furnace okay so that part of the process in making steel steel on the other hand is defined as um the the alloy of alloy iron where remember we mentioned that it contains some other elements such as carbon um so it has to reduce the um the carbon element from the iron ore itself in order to make steel okay so let us look so this is just um a background in terms of the material steel itself let's look at the process of recycling now so for example you have you have to have collection right so you have scrap iron the scrap iron is collected and stored it's then melted down in the furnace remember we melt it down to make pig iron the, the, the melted or molten iron is then made into um, billets this is what is happening here which would then be transported to other customers who will use it as raw materials to make it into something else so this is what the recycling process would look like then we have composting so composting is also a type of recycling so composting is nature's process of recycling decomposed organic material so so the material that we're recycling here is organic um, so it's a breaking down of that organic material um, and anything that is once um, was once living can decompose all right this is often done very easily in our backyard so we can have backyard composting and it's a very um, it's a natural process that is environmentally friendly um, what are the benefits of composting firstly it enriches our soils so it encourages the production of beneficial microorganisms which in turn break down our organic matter to make humus so that is what makes the you know nice top soil etc and it also um, composting has also been shown to suppress plant diseases and pests it reduces and il or eliminates the need for fertilizers and it also tends to promote higher yields for agricultural crops because remember one of the problems they always often face in the agricultural industry is the through the use of um, things like chemicals and pesticides and all of that it may actually make things worse eh? sometimes the 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 insects and pests become resilient to these chemicals and it ends up proliferating instead and of course there's also the toxic nature of these chemicals so through the use of composting we can actually avoid some of these negative environmental outcomes um, compost also helps to clean up contaminated soil it has been shown to absorb odors and treat volatile both semi volatile and volatile organic materials so some of these um, volatile compounds would be things like heating fuels so those are oils um, polyamorotic 
aromatic sorry um hydrocarbons and explosives so these are different types of oils contaminated oils that um the composting can actually absorb it also has been shown to bind to heavy um heavy metals and prevent them from migrating into um, your water sources or being absorbed from plants so you see um you see several other benefits here from the use of composting so um it protects your plants from absorbing the contaminants and it also hinders the the ability of these contaminants to enter your groundwater sources through um runoff on the surface etc it helps prevent pollution as mentioned before the ability to prevent pollutants from entering your storm water uh, and from reaching your water sources so that when rain falls for example normally it, it will wash off um, uh, compounds in your topsoil um, so the the compost will bind to the heavy metals and hinder that um, that migration and it also prevents erosion and siltation so in a similar manner it hinders erosion of your topsoil and silting up of your waterways So there are also economic benefits um, these economic benefits can reduce the need for water fertilizers and pesticides so you don't have to invest money in um, irrigation and these chemicals as well it serves um, it serves as a marketable commodity so many of you I'm sure you have seen um, some of these plant stores agriculture stores where they're actually selling compost there you, you can buy bags of compost so it can actually be sold out there um, produced as a product and sold it's also a low-cost alternative to standard landfill cover and an artificial soil amendment so improving your top soil um, you you can actually also use it to cover um, organic waste etc okay So we have a couple different types of composts um, that we can look at. The first we're going to look at is aerobic composting. So aerobic composting, this is the one that most of us will be familiar with. You have, um, this is composting that uses air to break down the materials. Um, it uses uh, materials such as grass clippings and other green materials, grass, plants, etc. Uh, that grows bacteria and it creates a high temperature right um, as part of the process of um, decomposing it's important to frequently turn the compost pile to remove the excess heat because remember here we mentioned it produces high temperatures you want to remove the excess heat and, and allow more oxygen to circulate so you'll, you'll have to be turning it over all right um, the good thing about this type of comp composting is that it does not produce any smell and it breaks down very quickly the anaerobic composting um, so this is done without the use of air so this is different from the aerobic all right it requires less maintenance so it doesn't require any turning over because you don't need to aerate anything um, uses also includes grass clippings but you're also also looking at kitchen waste non fatty kitchen waste all right so it, it'll be very moist um, so it typically is moist and it pro it produces a very slimy um, type of um, compost okay um, types of organisms that live in this compost will be things like lava beetles and other types of scavenger organisms so organism so organisms would live in there and remember as I said before it's it's moist and slimy etc and um, exposing the compost to oxygen will actually slow down the process because remember this one is being done without the use of air so here we have a nice little table that actually allows us to compare the characteristics of the two uh, the first row uh, um, I believe these are just different types of containers alright so we can skip over that and we would look um, so if you follow with me aerobic um, it's fueled by oxygen and moisture whereas anaerobic is fueled by bacteria and moisture notice the absence of oxygen um, aerobic you turn weakly anaerobic you don't turn it at all um, aerobic um, it produces 
a large amount of um, compost anaerobic produces a small amount um, aerobic can be ready in six weeks anaerobic actually takes much longer it can take as much as six months the aerobic actually kills pathogens and weeds in the soils whereas the anaerobic can actually spread pathogens and weeds so these are some of the major characteristics that you would need to recall in order to um, compare and contrast between the two and then we also have a third type of composting that we call vermicomposting so vermicomposting um, consists of food waste um, and we break that down using earthworms um, so you would add food scraps to a bin etc and then you would add um, the earthworms as well the earthworms what would they actually do is they would feed on the bacteria and the fungi that growing it that grows in the food waste and once they feed on it what happens next is they actually release waste the earthworms release waste um, and their waste or their drop-ins or castings as as it can be called um, this is actually what is used as a natural fertilizer so see waste from the earthworms all right note that you would also want to you would want to do this inside because earthworms can become very sensitive to he extreme heat and cold so you might want to do this inside um, it is beneficial this type of composting because it re it improves root plant root structure plant growth and also is good for the blooming of new flowers okay so it's very good for plant growth additionally um, we want to look very briefly at the MRF or the materials recovery facility so if you recall we would have made mention of the materials recovery facility before uh, for example these types of activities and operations can actually take place at a transfer station as well so the materials recovery facility or the MRF this is the location that accepts recyclable materials um, whether the materials have been sorted beforehand or not so um, at this facility you find this is where we would separate materials um, processing of the materials the recyclable materials can take place and storing of them for later use where um, you would probably then look to distribute them to other manufacturers as raw materials to produce new products okay so the main function of the materials recovery facility is to maximize the opportunity for recyclables to be processed um, so we have that means then that we have an established well organized well run facility where you know now you can actually take your recyclables there or deposit your recyclables at a collection point in order to be processed so so greater opportunity for recycling to take place at this facility it also produces materials that will generate the highest possible revenues at the market so it's not remember it's not only sorting and cleaning that takes place here some amount of processing to make new raw materials for the market is um, is achieved at the MRF and then we'll also look briefly at the recovery of used oil so used oil is also another problem another environmental problem for us uh, because used oil will often be contaminated and um, when the oil is contaminated it can no longer be used for its original application whether you're talking about um, oil for cooking or you're talking about um, fuel for cars we use oils for different things all right so when the oil has been contaminated we have to look at several options can we re re refine the oil by cleaning it up and processing it somehow or if we cannot achieve this we have to consider what safe options for disposal do we have okay so some of the concerns with regards to contaminated oil um, would be illnesses it can produce diseases in humans and animals through um, inhalation through the nose ingestion through the mouth or skin contact 
okay and some common diseases that can result um, from contaminated oil would be things like um, pneumonia then we have lung diseases such as lipoid granuloma so this is where you have lesions on the lungs um, eczematous and contact dermatitis this would be inflammatory skin conditions folliculitis which would be infections of hair follicles then we have acne that comes from the contaminated oil contact with the contaminated oil and melanosis which would be um, where you have excessive deposits of melanin in the skin so you'd have like uh, patches of discoloration on your skin so all of these are examples of diseases that can affect human beings from contaminated oil then of course remember animals can also be affected animals and aquatic organisms they will actually share some of the human health effects that we just looked at from contaminated oil so you can actually have acute toxicity in the fish uh, some of the animals including fish can actually develop tumors as a result of contact with contaminated oil these are just a few examples So at this point I want to thank you for joining me for today's lesson. Um, please refer to eClassroom for today's activity. Thank you.